Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, dear delegates, dear speakers, and dear guests, and welcome to this plenary session, Tackling Poverty, What is the Role of Transport? Without wanting to foreshadow the answers of our distinguished panelists, I think we can safely agree that there is a strong correlation between poverty alleviation and access to safe and affordable transportation, as a lack of transportation options often makes it difficult for underserved communities to access <clears throat> economic opportunities. So in this session, we want to explore how policies for equitable access for transport can improve access to jobs, education, and other opportunities for disadvantaged citizens, and address questions around how transport can help reduce poverty in both developed and developing countries, how knowledge sharing and innovation can help address different mobility needs. And I'd now like to introduce you to our speakers. First of all, I would like to welcome to the panel Minister Amadou Mansour Fayet. He was born in St. Louis, Senegal, has a background in mechanical engineering, and is the Minister of Infrastructure, Land Transport, and Opening Up in Senegal. Welcome, sir. Bienvenue. I would next like to welcome Minister Renan Filo. He started his political career back in 2004, was first mayor, then a federal congressman, and in 2014 was elected governor of the state of Alagas. His term was distinguished by the recovery of the state's investment capacity with progress in the area of infrastructure, education, health, and public security. In 2018, he was re-elected governor of state and in 2022 became senator of the Republic. And this year was appointed by the Lula administration as minister of transport in Brazil. Welcome, sir. I would like to also give a warm welcome to Amanda Ngabrino. She is the chairperson of the National Physical Planning Board, the highest body responsible for physical planning in Uganda. She's also the former vice president of the World Cycling Alliance, an urban regional planner, and a lecturer at Makera University, Kampala. She has conducted research on informal <clears throat> informality and transportation complexities, road safeties, and quality of public space in Kampala in partnership with different international researchers. She has also initiated Kampala's non-motorized transport pilot concept, which is Kampala's new Namibamba Road, Luhum Street, a typical example of inclusiveness where walking, cycling, and quality of public space have finally been prioritized. And Amanda is also passionate about sustainable urban development and, of course, cycling. Welcome to this panel. <laughs> Equally warm welcome, please, for Eric Yonat, who has over 38 years of experience in public affairs, building connections and organizing dialogues between businesses, policymakers, and other stakeholders. He has been active both in the automotive industry as well as consumer goods industry through management roles in both Europe and Asia, and is currently chair of FIPRA International, a public affairs consultancy that is based in Brussels, Belgium, with a global network in over 50 countries. He is focusing on EU policy affecting the future of mobility, looking at the impact of both green and digital transition across all transport modes. And driven by a passion for sustainability and mobility, he's actively involved in the New Mobility Foundation, leading the international division, of which he is a co-founder and director. The New Mobility Foundation has been created to address mobility poverty and make mobility accessible and affordable for all citizens. Perfect fit for this panel, welcome. And also a very warm welcome to Dr. Kalpana Viswanath. She heads Safety Pin and is involved in designing projects and creating partnerships, both government and civil society. She also represents the organization, <clears throat> this organization in different international forums, such as the ITF. Um, Kalpana writes regularly and has a weekly column in the Hindustan Times on urban issues. She has worked on issues of gender and urbanization for over 20 years now with several organizations, including UN Women, UN Habitat, and Yogori, among others, and has led different global projects and provided technical support on women's safety to several cities. 
Kalpana is also a member of the advisory group on gender issues at UN Habitat, chairperson of Yorgori, and a board member of the International Center of Prevention of Crime. She was part of the commitment committee that prepared a report for women's safety in Delhi for the city government. Fantastic to have you on this panel. Welcome. And finally, please give also a warm welcome to Jorge Villegas. He was re-elected for a second term as the FIM president in 2022. He has had several roles with FIM over the last decades, starting as member and president of the FIM or FIM Promotion Commission in 1992, before being appointed as vice president in various terms between 96 and 2014. He's also served several terms as a board member <clears throat> and was a member of the Court of Sport in Portugal, as well as a member of the Portuguese Olympic Committee. Welcome to this panel. So before we begin with our discussion, I would just like to point out that, of course, we have trans translation provided for you and uh, the channels for French, we have three, no, channel number three, and for Portuguese, it's channel number 12. So I would like to begin with our discussion and address you, Minister Filho, with the first question. I would like to start with kind of the big picture, looking at everything. Maybe you can let us know your view on how transport feeds inequality when it's not accessible and affordable, and in what ways this can be overcome, or rather, how can investment in transport and logistics really help reduce poverty and foster economic inclusion and growth? Olha, o transporte, quando exclui ele leva a uma injustiça muito grave, sobretudo porque ela é replicada. É impossível uma comunidade isolada e pobre sair da well, pobreza. Ela, uh, antes a community da pobreza, is being excluded, isolated uh, through unequal access. And before a community can take part in social life, it needs to be able to get out of this exclusion and isolation. In addition to that, what we need are public investments so that these communities can get out of this isolation that they find themselves in. In addition to that, we need to be able to generate private and attract private capital so that the states would be able to invest the required resources and have the required resources in order to bring about positive effects for the isolated community, communities. Last century, in the 30s of last century in Brazil, we had a president, Washington Luiz was his name, and he did, he said something uh, which indeed made the round. He said that governments open streets and after that development takes in and development will ultimately on that basis reach these communities and this is a challenge for us also these days we need to guarantee mobility which at the same time means that we guarantee freedom for the people and it's an important step for these communities to be able to grow to develop and in order to be able to do that, they need to be able to travel to various service stations, to the hospitals, to schools and other facilities. If we do that, we can break through this vicious circle so that these communities get out of their isolation. Thank you very much. Um, Minister Faye, I would like you to kindly share views on the situation, situation in Senegal from a Senegalese perspective, and in particularly, perhaps you could provide an overview of the initiatives and policies implemented in Senegal to help leverage <clears throat> um, the situation, address poverty, and improve accessibility, especially yeah, for different kind of communities in your country. Voilà, je vous remercie par rapport à la question. Tout à l'heure, je donnais... Thank you very much for your question. And I 
gave an example from Dakar. In Dakar, a quarter of the total population of our country live in this country, four to five million. Out of these five million, only 30 percent uh, use motorized vehicle for their travel. But for that, you need infrastructure in Dakar. We've got a very dense building, or rather a very high building density which is not the case for the whole of the Senegalese territory. We have developed strategies so that we can reach out to various communities. We've got a collectivity program for the rural area. We have built up an infrastructure network in the rural areas, and through the African Development Bank, we are able to attract additional investments so that we can further the development in rural areas and mining areas. In other departments of Senegal, we have 2,700 kilometers of road which are being built in an integral manner so that all regions of Dakar can be reached. This is a very important program. To get more mobility, we need infrastructure. And we, if we have that, the population can not only travel within the rural areas, but we can also foster agricultural production in these areas. We are going to, uh, to extend the road network there so that the population can travel um, in the country. Gabriano, how does the situation compare to Uganda, or more specifically to Kampala? And transportation and infrastructure, of course, are broad and vast. Perhaps we can begin to break it down a little bit. Perhaps you can share what parts of the transportation sector, what types of infrastructure you, you feel are most relevant in the context of poverty re alleviation and transportation. Thank you very much, Geraldine. Uh, I think we have two parts. We have the urban and the rural uh, areas that we have to deal with. They have sharp differences in terms of mobility and access to facilities like uh, schools, hospitals, like the Honorable Minister was saying and what he also mentioned. Uh, the main modes really, the informal uh, sector is leading in provision of public transport. Walking is roughly at 60% in our capital, Kampala. Uh, the majority of trips are made on foot. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure is not perfect for the 60%. The infrastructure investment is mostly for the 10% private motorists and almost nothing for the 30% public transport users. So that is the state and uh, we have a lot of road safety issues, which of course we are getting better at, but still we have uh, a big challenge of road safety. And from the urban perspective, the urban poor uh, are forced to, to be killed or injured on the roads because there is no provision, there is no adequate provision in this. The policies are good, the uh, infrastructure budget sharing is still really not focusing on the 60% of the people. In the rural um, areas, access to schools, sometimes it's about 15 kilometers walking from home to school. And what kind of distance is this for a child of seven to 13 years? Uh, and what motivation do they have to keep doing this every day? Uh, so access is still uh, really, uh, uh, there's a gap there. Also to health services, some uh, facilities are quite away from where people live, like hospitals. And uh, of course we know that a hospital is beyond a, a building. There's also staffing issues, uh, administrative issues, but the location matters. So the urban planning and uh, land use planning aspect is very strong. Uh, we see that there's a very strong uh, possibility of addressing access issues through land use planning and, and regulations. Uh, but for now, we are still green. We are happy we are green, but not green by choice because we have 60% of the population doing that. We are also not happy with the informal public transport because it's still inefficient, inadequate, mm -hmm. but we are also happy we still have it to, to counteract the 10% 
private motorists, which is growing uh, annually because of the uh, inadequacies in public transport. Uh, we are dreaming of having better public transportation systems, but we are also dreaming of uh, uh, facilitating the current providers of the informal public transport so that they are not left out in the public transport improvements. That is such an important point, and perhaps just to clarify, um, when you say informal public transport, we are talking mainly about privately run minibuses in, 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 in the first instance. Is that the case? Yeah, they are privately owned, we assume, but there could be some people like us who own them, but the business is private and profit-oriented. It's not a government public transport service. And we call them informal because they set up their own entry terms, exit, and by also, they also set their own routes, trips, stops, fares, uh, so they are really not uh, uh, that organized, but we are also happy that we have them, because socially, what would we do if they didn't have those jobs? Uh, socially, what we'd, would uh, the citizens do if that was not available for them to travel? So we still want to organize, but also organize cautiously mm -hmm. that we don't affect the livelihoods of these uh, informal uh, public transport providers. Yeah, yeah, extremely important point. Thanks so much for the clarification. And of course, I'd like to invite you later to share a little bit about how you're doing this and how you're addressing these 60%. Um, Dr. Kalpana Viswanath, I would like you to share on the same topic <clears throat> this question of what elements, what specific aspects of the transport system need to be addressed to ensure that the voices of resource poor people are at the table when being planned and which issues are the most pressing from your perspective. Thank you. You know, I think one of the things we need to uh, foreground in this discussion is the issue of poverty. And I think um, post COVID-19 and 2020, the entire, before that, there was a sort of a movement towards reducing poverty globally, um, slowly, uh, uh, but we were sort of a little bit um, far away from the 2030 goals. Mm -hmm. But COVID-19 has set us back tremendously, and I think something we have to put in, in, in within the context. Uh, for example, we, we have seen that 70 million more people were pushed into extreme poverty post-2020. So we are, and the losses of the poorest 40% was twice as high as the top 20%. You know, so I think um, the inequality has also increased. So for me, I think, and, and when we say there's a setback in, uh, in poverty, it's not just income. It is health outcomes, it's education outcomes. We know that, um, especially among resource poor people in many countries, including in India where I come from, the opportunity for education was lost for almost three years because everyone did not have access to a mobile phone, to internet. And I think, therefore, in that context, when we talk about public transport, and, in, and as Amanda has spoken about it, but the, the statistics are quite um, overwhelming if we look at the Latin America, Africa, and Asia. It's like nearly over 80% of people are not car users. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case in such a large part of the world, how do we begin to reimagine our cities? Because unfortunately, we have all built our cities to move the car faster. And that is the fundamental question we have to grapple with today in the context of poverty. 80% are using public transport, walking. Let us be very, very clear. Millions of people walk to work, to school. Still, they use bicycles. We're trying to encourage bicycles. And then it's public transport. And what Amanda said, and what many people are now trying to say, it's not informal transport, but it's popular transport, because it is what people use. You know, and rather, by then defining it as something negative, we need to improve the entire arena. And I think all our countries have a lot of the um, resource poor using these forms of transport. So I would really urge that we need to find, it, it's urgent to find these solutions, because transport can play a central role in improving people's life outcomes. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Those are incredibly important points that you raised. And I think a lot of these concepts are gaining traction in many European cities. The idea of the 15-minute city, that things should be reachable in walking distance, for instance, or uh, debates around having free public transport, even. So um, a question I would like to address to you. We had this small glimpse of what really affordable public transport for everybody could look like with this nine euro ticket that we had uh, during yeah, a short COVID season, let's say, in Germany. And the minister uh, announced, German minister Wissing announced yesterday um, that we have now unlocked the uh, federal 49 euro ticket in Germany. So people can travel in every city with public transportation and across Germany on regional trains for 49 euro a month. Um, do you, I would, I would love to hear your perspective on this in general and how you think countries, specifically wealthy countries like Germany, should be leading by example when it comes to transportation and poverty alleviation, especially in this correlation with public transport and making that affordable. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you for the question. I mean, it's in, interesting to hear the different perspectives and where we all come from, mm. I mean, different challenges when it comes to mobility. You have the places where people have to walk for hours before they can get to a job uh, or to, to schools. Uh, and then you have the countries like in Europe, where everybody is sitting in their car to go to schools, leading to traffic congestions, and where we encourage people now to walk more, right? Uh, and so you have this, del this dilemma, uh, which is different from, from region to region in the world, which in fact underlines the need when we talk the subject like mobility poverty, to look at it in, yeah, in its context. Every country is going to be different. The needs are going to be different from country to country and even within a country from place to place. Public transportation in a region like Europe is indeed important, is already quite advanced. Let's uh, recognize it. It can always be better, right? Uh, that's always the problem when you have something you want it to be better. Yeah? Uh, and it, the question is how far can you go to make it indeed more accessible and affordable to people? Uh, is incentivizing public transport by making the, the price to access public transportation lower, is that a way forward? It could be. The question is how sustainable is that? Because it costs money. Somebody will have to pay it. Yeah? Uh, and you have the tendency in, in some countries in Europe to you know, finance left and right. Deficits, deficits are increasing everywhere. So there is a limit to this yeah, game of putting money everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, when we go for the solution, the question is also, you know, how sustainable is it? Because you don't, it could be temporarily a good idea to incentivize people so they get at least, you know, used to a new means of transportation uh, and then start using it uh, more systematically. You see that in effect across Europe as well, next to public transportation, with the greening of transport, the electrification of transport, where you see uh, a lot of governments trying to yeah, encourage an acceleration of this green transition by giving premiums and incentives to people to switch to an electric vehicle or to give them a tax break. Again, the question one needs to ask, how sustainable is that? You can do that initially in a transition mode in order to encourage people to move to another means of transport which may be sustainable. But you're not going to finance that forever. Huh? That's one. The other question is, should we not be uh, more go for a tailor-made system and give the premiums and incentives to the people who need it most? Now, often you see premiums being given to everybody, uh, or even those who, uh, who buy premium cars. Now, these this, this, this measures that governments take in Europe are really, I mean, you could say positive, because they, they help moving towards a trend which will make transport more accessible. However, what I would say, the top-down approach should be accompanied by a bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. And that's where organizations like our New Mobility Foundation step in, where we work in local communities, and it's this case in the Netherlands, working with listening first to the people who have no access to mobility. And it could be low-income families, but it could also be elderly people. It could be people with disabilities. 
and try to find solutions in a pragmatic way, not always a question of money. Yeah? Sometimes it's a question of bringing together other stakeholders who can help finding a solution in a concrete, in a tangible way. And the New Mobility Foundation has been instrumental in bringing different stakeholders together in local communities to start listening to each other, to identify the needs, and then, in function of this, these needs, come up with concrete solutions. And so that's, in fact, my plea here, especially in advanced economies, let's not rely only on governments. They, of course, have a role to play, and they play that role, but it should be complemented by an approach which is bottom-up, focusing on the local communities, involving the people who suffer from mobility poverty, and try to find concrete solutions. Thank you. Um, I would love to learn in, in the next round what those co-created or community-created solutions look like and what they entail. Um, and just as a side note, I think you can still buy expensive first-class tickets to take trains in Germany, so there's still that. <laughs> um, Mr. Viejas, you are passionate about motorcycles. I hid something from your biography that you're not just working in this area, but are also a passionate motorcycle driver, even Grand Prix driver yourself. So I'd like to have you share a little bit your views on this topic. I mean, in many uh, cities in, in different countries, motorcycles are really a key means of transportation and the only affordable type of taxi for many people, also part of an informal pu public transportation system. For instance, in Rwanda, that's definitely in, uh, in the main means of transportation, I would say, in the capital city, Kigali. So how would you say, can motorcycles help reduce poverty? Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, the FAM, or the Motorcycle, International Motorcycle Federation, is known by the races. I think almost all of you have seen motorcycle racing. But uh, the FAM has also an important role in mobility. <laughs> and I prepared a lot of things to tell you, but I prefer to tell you a story. When I was 15 years old, <clears throat> like a lot of boys in my age, we did everything to have a motorcycle because we wanted to have freedom, mobility, go to school, show to the girls, whatever, doesn't matter. We, everybody liked to have a motorcycle. And I had to work because my father didn't know, he could not know that I was having a motorcycle. So I worked in a workshop, I bought my motorcycle, I had my first crash, and then I decided to transform motorcycle and started racing. This is a typical European uh, boy. At, this was in the, I don't tell you my age, but this was in the <laughs> 70s. Then let's compare with the same boy in South America, as you said, when you need to open roads, it's, I like this phrase, uh, in Africa or in Asia. They do everything to have a motorcycle to work. To, it's a way to win their life as uh, informal transportation, but all activities, because the cars are too expensive, there are no public transports, so the solution is us, is a motorcycle. That's what I say, uh, we are the mobility. And uh, because it's much cheaper, you can go everywhere, you use to transport your family, as we all know, photos and videos of the whole family in a motorcycle. And they can develop their small economy, their small business, by having a motorcycle. That's why I'm trying to make the comparison. We have the tendency sometimes, we European, to say we are the center of the world, we need here, as you said, to go to small communities, to people that have no possibility of um, transporting themselves. But in those countries, it's completely different. It's the survival, it's development. So that's what I say, we can help a lot the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Just as an open invitation to all panelists, in case you want to say something in between me asking you questions, just give me a quick sign and I'd be happy to let you speak. Did you want to share something, Minister? Queria fazer um comentário a mais, enquanto aguardo. Eu presumo que quase só eu falo português nessa sala. 
Yes, thank you. I just wanted to wait for everyone to put on their headphones because I'm the only one speaking and understanding Portuguese. Well, we've heard it before, but what I wanted to highlight is that we have so different and complex challenges. The poorest countries, we see that infrastructure is the first priority because without infrastructure, there is no public transport. And secondly, if there is public transport, then we need to make sure that digitalization, sustainability, and the different demands of the individuals are also taken care of. However, there are so many different countries which have different challenges. Brazil, which is a rich but also a poor country, is facing different challenges. We have these two realities in Brazil. And to give you an example of what I'm talking about. In the past, in the past, we've transported millions of people through aviation, but through buses, we've also transported millions of people too. We also have a metro station, etc. But we see that rural areas are being isolated, and that's what we've heard from our African partners, where we have rural areas that are also isolated, where, and where poor people live. And motorcycles have actually replaced horses traveling by horse. So that goes to show that mobility is such a complex issue. And we need to take care that we bear in mind these different challenges so that we find tailor-made solutions and answers. And I see that we have a consensus here that mobility will be the solution to break through this vicious circle of poverty. Thank you very much. And there were some great keywords in there that are the perfect segue into the next topic because now that we have mapped the situation in different countries in the world and also mapped a little bit the different parts of transportation system that we're talking about, I want to zoom in on certain topics um, that correlate with transportation and poverty alleviation, new business models and digitization, which you just mentioned, green transition, which you also mentioned, and gender issues. So starting with new business models, I want to get back to the motorcycle topic. As I already mentioned, um, I, uh, I know the situation in Gali, and I was in luck to interview a very interesting startup there. I wanted to share this example with you. They are basically like an Uber for motorcycle taxi drivers. And um, so it makes it safe for the customer and easy and reliable to order one of these moto taxis. And you can see the ranking of your driver and everything that we know from these kind of apps. But what they also do is they create financial services for their drivers. And basically over this app and the money they earn, create a bank account system where they can have savings, many of these motorcycle drivers don't really own bank accounts. So looking at new business models and new approaches for poverty reduction, where are you perhaps seeing similar such examples or ways that, uh, yeah, there is perhaps a connection between motorcycles and new business models? Uh, <clears throat> as as we, all, we or all of us are aware, there is a big discussion in this moment to regulate this kind of activity, mainly in Europe. So all these informal transportation systems mm -hmm. were exported to Europe by Uber and Bolt, mainly these two, there are more. But, and now there is the, the problems of the social integration of these drivers, the protection of these drivers, the regulation, the taxes, all of this is a big discussion in Europe in this moment. Because obviously you can, uh, sometimes there are some Let's call it companies that explore those, those uh, drivers. Uh, and this is really on the table in this moment. And many countries or cities have already started regulating this transportation. Uh, and so it, it, this is a different problem. It's a, a, a way of mobility because we all use these services. But I think it's a bit different from what happens in the less developed countries. Mm -hmm. As you said very well, it's, we are facing mainly the, the fact that 
a lot of cities are isolated. And if they don't get out of the isolation, they get out of poverty. So we have first to invest in infrastructures and give them a motorcycle to work. That's, a, that's the solution. Thank you. Um, may I pass to you? I would love to know if, yes, perhaps you also know of any ways that new business models, digitization or innovations in that area are creating new opportunities. Um, and, and yes, then I'll ask you to share a bit more about the how that we left off at earlier. Um, the how of your dressing the 60%. Yeah. When uh, he was sharing, I was smiling because um, in Uganda and maybe Lagos, Nairobi as well, I don't think people love to keep the motorcycles. And uh, they love them, they hate them in equal measure because they need to move but how they are moving. So I would like to comment on the regulation aspect that he, he hinted on. It's very important that transportation is regulated, not only motorcycles. Integrated regulation is, is what is key, I think. Uh, because sometimes even the pedestrians are misbehaving, bicycle riders are misbehaving, the uh, minibuses are misbehaving, private motorists are misbehaving. So to isolate the motorcycles for regulation is always interpreted as being against them, being against their survival, being against their, their business. So it creates a scenario of government against the public transport providers. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit sensitive how it is done. And uh, what you mentioned, the transition mode is very important. Uh, how we transit from this motorcycle. Also other uh, factors like emissions, passenger capacity. How does the motorcycle fit in the future of things, a space, public space? And uh, it could be a transition that we still need to, to refine and to regulate. I think we might have to use another word uh, because they feel attacked, like we are going to be kicked out. We've seen uh, an attempt in Kampala to create a border border. We call them border borders, those motorcycles. I think in Lagos they are called the uh, Okadas. They have different names. In Kenya, I think it's border border. And these border borders, we created a border border free zone in the city. It did not work even for one hour. It was impossible because the city was not connected uh, from all points. It is the border border that was connecting the city, connecting people, connecting places. So we still are in need of knowing how best we can be efficient, but also inclusive and also enable people to get out of poverty through mobility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, would you like, please, go ahead, Kalpana. Yeah, I think this, this is a really interesting point of the discussion. And uh, I, I, I like the point that, you know, what does a motorcycle represent? But what does dif different forms of transport represent? And I think um, what Amanda, you're saying is that, in many of our, in many countries, I mean, there's also the element when you're talking about transport. There's also the element of the risk of transport, right? And the road safety and the deaths that are being caused. So what we are seeing is the majority of people who are dying or getting injured are pedestrians and bicyclists, right? Uh, and in in many countries, including in India, a majority of the people who are in some way involved in the accident or this thing are the two wheelers. And it's not because of regulation, it is because, or even if you go to Bangkok, in the extreme traffic, you'll see the two wheelers are the guys who can go through it. And so, in fact, a lot of people take the two wheelers, but they do drive in a more um, dangerous way, mm -hmm. you know, because of the, this thing. Now, there's also a new element that the, when you talk about employment and uh, the two-wheelers, uh, at least in India and I think several other countries, the entire new gig economy of delivery. So the delivery boys and delivery young women who are delivering um, food items, anything, right? Mm -hmm. So you have your, one is your taxis, which is your Uber and all that, but then you have this new gig economy, uh, which is about delivery. Now, the same point he talked about Uber needing, needing regulation and exploitative uh, business practices, we are seeing exactly the same. But the point is, there is a need. 
and there are people who need jobs. So very often, the regulation comes after this reality happens. Yeah. Because people need work, people need um, to move, people need um, things to buy, right? And the COVID uh, situation actually ag uh, made people much more within their homes ordering things. And uh, the, the, the idea, for example, in India, we have, we have delivery which promises that you can, in some cities that you can get anything you want in 10 minutes. Now this is a problem because the KPA of that driver is to reach in 10 minutes. Yep. He is putting his life in danger. So I think there are so many elements that we need to look at. And it is difficult for governments because, you know, you're having to legislate uh, a reality like the Boda Boda. You're saying, okay, ban it. There is no questioning of banning of any of this because they are fulfilling a need of the people. They are, um, they are needed. And I think it's more um, important, like what you were saying, is to do a bottom-up now. Let's talk to all the stakeholders. Let's not sit somewhere else and make policy. Mm -hmm. Let's understand what women need. Let's understand what students need. Let's understand what these delivery uh, people need. What, let's understand what companies need. Let's also talk to Uber and all their exploitative business practices and say, listen, if you want to function in our countries, it has to be like this. You know, so I think it's really time and it's important that many, many of our streets are very chaotic today because of all these problems, you know. Yeah. But the truth is we have to go out. We have to work. I don't know about in Europe, but in India and many other countries, post-COVID, everyone is back to work on the streets. You know, people are not sitting at home. And remember, people in poverty do not have the luxury of working from home. If you're a domestic worker, mm -hmm. through the pandemic, you lost your, all your income, all your occupation. So I think, you know, we need to nuance this so much more. And I really appreciate what all of you are saying about this. Mm. Thank you. I think this is such an important point on inclusive policy making. I know that's also something that you're working on, Eric, and I'll pass to you in a sec. I just wanted to share that um, I think that's, there was a very important initiative also from the Ministry of Labour in Germany to really involve the drivers, involve the, all the gig workers in thinking about how to redesign social security for these precariously self-employed people in future. And these are definitely conversations that need to be part of this conversation. Eric, I want to let you react and I also want to connect with another question on this topic of platform regulation, if I may. Um, so we've already outlined some of the complexities and difficulties around that. In many countries, these Silicon Valley platforms, particularly Uber, have really taken over the whole taxi business, the local taxi business. And with every transaction that is made, 25% in the case of Uber goes straight um, out of those countries and to, let's just generalize here and say to Silicon Valley. So governments are losing out in taxes and local operators, in the worst case, are driven out of the market, which are, of course, also economic implications in those countries themselves. So what policies do you feel are necessary to make sure that platform operators are really contributing to positive social and economic developments for all and not just for their own profit margins? No, thank you for the question, and I would like to make the link Please. as yeah. well of the connection with the previous round. Because at the end of the day, we, we, what is on the agenda is how do we address mobility poverty. Yeah. And so in this discussion, we should keep in mind, you know, those people who have a need <laughs> to a mobility solution. Yeah? Because otherwise they cannot go to work or they don't have access to health care or no access to education. Yeah. And I think we should approach discussion from that point of view. It's those people who suffer from mobility poverty who should be at the center of this discussion and through which lens we should look at solutions. And at the end of the day, these solutions will be different depending on the country they are, are in or are living, depending on the need they have. When we talk about low-income people, but we also talk about elderly, uh, uh, who you may ask them to walk, but if they cannot walk, they better have you know, other means of transport. And it could be uh, ride sharing or a vehicle. Yeah? So I would say, let's watch out to 
to express vetoes <laughs> to certain technologies or certain means of transport, we should remain open-minded and go for the solutions which are fit for purpose in a given situation. Mm -hmm. And it can be different from country to country. Yeah? The new platforms in that respect, I mean, why have all these platforms been created? If there was no need out there, there would not have been that response. You know? These businesses can only flourish when there is a need to which they respond. Right? So if nobody needed this kind of service, they would not have been successful. If everybody was of the opinion you could take a taxi like in the past, or like we still do, eh, then there was no need for this platform. So what you see with these platforms and other solutions, it's not necessarily only these platforms, it's good, I think, that they shake us up, <laughs> because that's what innovation is about, is, is really force us to think differently about new mobility solutions. Now, having said that, they should also fit into the environment in which they are launched. And it should happen with respect for the local regulations and with respect for the social rights of people who could be affected. And the only way to do that is to engage in dialogue, in mm -hmm. my opinion. It's yeah. take a collaborative approach. This morning we heard a lot about it's a team sport. Well, even for these new initiatives, it's a question of engaging with the other players. And that's in fact what we also do with the New Mobility Foundation. That we see is a, is a formula for success, engaging together with the different players, instead of coming into and forcing up upon others, you know, a certain model of a certain choice. So that's, that would be my, you know, response to the the challenge, if you can call it the challenge, of, of all these platforms. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, um, I think, uh, as you said, you know, involving all stakeholders involved, there are great examples, like that company from Rwanda that I mentioned, that are fulfilling financial service needs and transportation needs, because they really looked at what, what do the drivers and what do the passengers need. I would love to let, maybe you have an example for me how this works. And maybe you can, even if this would be the best of cases, because I would like to connect, as I said earlier, also with the topic of um, green transition and how you feel there is a correlation between um, green transition, poverty alleviation, and transportation. Um, so maybe you have an example of how you're working with communities and how they are coming up with their own solutions, particularly on this topic. Like in Germany, there's so much polarization on the topic of, you know, um, I mean, there's been a lot of conversations around that the last uh, two days here as well, um, leaving choices for people and not dictating the future whilst at the same time nudging people to change their behavior, you know, and this is causing a lot of polarization here at the moment. Maybe you have an example from how you work at the New Mobility Foundation on this topic. Well, look, one, one example is uh, what we have been able to start up in the Netherlands with the uh, National uh, Royal Auto Automotive Club, yeah? where we, we saw in the different communities across the Netherlands a, a need for people to be transported from certain places, from the home, to especially hospitals, yeah, to, to, to get health care. Especially people from rural areas, where there was no public transport. And there was a volunteering system set up by the members of this automobile club, offer ride sharing, a ride sharing service, not for free, but at the cost of yeah, the gasoline yeah, that was shared. Yeah. So you could say this is a very simple example, but it, it required identifying the issue, making sure you find the people who help, and at a very, you could say, in, in a very yeah, non-expensive way, we were able to mobilize people to build upon the willingness of people to engage and to help the community and, and take it forward. And it started locally and it was then expanded uh, nationally. And I think by doing this type of initiative, you could 
argue, you contribute also to the green transition. It's a little step, I realize that. Another example is when you talk digital transition, where we helped funding a startup which in fact provided the technology for a bicycle to be transformed in a tricycle, you know? So, so especially for elderly people who were not yeah, used anymore to, to, to use their bike, they didn't feel safe enough, through the transformation, by using this technology, they could, again, use their bike. And it was easy, it was accessible, it was affordable, you know? Um, so, often it's a question of supporting local startups mm -hmm. as well to help them taking the initiative and then see how we can expand it. And what, 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 what the New Mobility Foundation tries to do is act as a catalyst there. You know, bring the people together and try to see how we can further expand best practices. Thank you. So there was a mention about, do you want to add quickly? Yeah, yeah quickly. There's uh, something that he mentioned that intrigued me. We have two examples. One is a bad example. The other one is a good example related to engagements and uh, including all people in the dialogue. The bad example was that an investor imported 100 buses to provide efficient public transport in Kampala. It did not work because it was beyond buses. There, there was need for infrastructure, preparation of the uh, current public transport providers, stops, you know, stations, ticketing system, the boundaries of operation because from the city you extend into other local governments. So what we did as a good example, we learned from that mistake because that failed completely. So now we started what we call a paratransit consultative forum and it's working really, really well because we asked the motorcycles, uh, where do you make the most money? They had to show us their trips by mapping in a room. They said, no, the most money comes from 500 meter distance. We don't make money when we do 10 kilometers. Mm. So they started rearranging their own trips. We asked the taxi 14 seater uh, vans, do you make money when you go 70 kilometers from Kampala? No. We actually make more money this trip, seven kilometers. So it, it gives the planners, the authority, an opportunity to hear from the experts. We are not experts. The experts are on the ground. And I think we are learning quite well. It, we shall do it in a sustainable way, I think. Thank you. Really good examples. Thank you very much. There was a little mention already earlier on motorcycles and emissions. Maybe you can share a little bit how motorcycles are also connected with the energy transition currently. This is another uh, forum, right? <laughs> because there's so much to say. I would say there is not one solution. Mm -hmm. This is the major thing. We cannot go only to one solution. There will be multiple solutions to try to impeach that we finish like uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken in some years. That's the problem. The earth is heating and we need to, to do something to stop that. So in our... You know that there are three main sectors that contribute to the emissions. One is the mobility, the other is the electricity production, and the other is heating and cooling. We, in the mobility, we are doing a lot of things. And mainly, now talking about uh, my sector, it is the present, it is not the future. We have millions of urban, scooters or motorcycles that are electric. And you can see in my stand some examples. And this is a reality. In China, in many, many cities, you can only uh, go with electric motorcycles. So what, and this is a reality, but if we think about the, the big bikes, it's still, we are still far away from having a good solution solution because the batteries are too heavy and they don't have enough autonomy for a, a proper utilization. Mm -hmm. So, in this moment, as we speak, there is a lot of investigation in what concerns the eco fuels. Okay, and this is already tested and proved that can be used. The price is still uh, around 7 euros the litre, which is uh, three, four times 
the actual price of the, the fuel, but it will come down with uh, bigger utilization. Just for the joke, for you to know, the Formula One announced that they are going to be uh, with no uh, carbon footprint, right? And they are developing a fully synthetic fuel for the Formula One. And there are people from FIA here, so don't, they don't let me lie. But the <laughs> cost of this fuel is around 100 euros the litre. So you can imagine how much it costs a Formula One Grand Prix just in full. But this is, this is a, a parenthesis, a joke. We are, what we are doing in FIM is that we have set up, for the ones who know a bit this motorcycling sport, the Moto E competition, which is a, a showcase, is to show the way. It doesn't mean that uh, this is the future. It doesn't mean that these bikes uh, can be really uh, have a mass production. But we have the obligation, as we are very visible, to show that we are concerned and to show some examples of making this energetic transition. Now, the big question is, you know, the batteries and the batteries need electricity. Where this com electricity comes from? That's the big problem. And how, what you do to the lithium after, okay? This is, I, I, as I say, I'm not going, the, the, this is my, my, my profession is uh, linked to the renewable energy, but this is another forum. We are here for mobility. Not <laughs> yes, and at the same time, of course, there's a clear connection around emissions, healthy life in cities. You mentioned this earlier and you also touched upon it. How do you think electrification is going to impact um, and, and what other thoughts do you have on the connection between the green transition, transport and poverty alleviation, Kalpana? I mean, I think the point that you just made, I think, is, is something we need to think about because there's yeah. so much focus on electrification that someone who replaces their um, you know, car with a diesel, uh, electric car thinks that they have done their contribution to making the world a better place. But the point remains that there's congestion on the roads. The point remains that um, if you continue to build the roads faster and faster to move more cars, uh, in addition to the lithium and all that, I mean, going beyond that, there's also, there's road safety, there's the inequities that are there in our country. So I think public transport, buses, electrification of buses is important because these are public transport. I think this is where the focus should be on, you know, and I agree, it's not that we can re remove all cars. You know, nobody's saying that. But I think we have many more cars than we need to today. There are countries where families have three cars, you know, and I think there is a problem there. So let's get back to the popular, informal, non-formal transit transport, which is what the majority of the world is still using. How do we make that also sustainable? So for example, in India, we have what we call the e-rickshaws. So they are like, you know, the little rickshaws where you, it's a shared mobility from the metro station to all, you know, and it's like, it's shared, you, five people can get in one. But they have electrified that in many cities. Now these are solutions which are going to make a difference. And I don't know if it's because they're e-rickshaws, but they actually move slower. <laughs> than other rickshaws. So even safety gets addressed by that fact, you know, and they're open. So even during COVID it worked because they're not closed spaces. So, you know, they, you could maintain uh, social distance. It was also safe, you know, I mean, we will discuss this when you come to the issue of gender and women, but safety and feeling that, you know, I can be seen when I'm on the street. So I think, um, you know, we have to come back to the basics. And the basics is those who are not served. The mobility poverty we're talking about, you know. And I think unless we, uh, we, we cannot continue beyond 20, 30, 20, 50 with so much inequality and poverty. It is unacceptable as a human race, I would say. Yeah. Absolutely. I think this is a good point. I would like to pass it back to, to you, ministers, um, and, and address you both with, basically with this question that was just raised by Kapana. Um, perhaps you can begin and share this role of sustainability in promoting new forms of transportation and really bringing development to peripheral and especially vulnerable communities. How, how are you approaching that? How do you see that role? Do you want to go first, sir? Especially, also, so maybe if you want, can include, pardon, pardon, <laughs> just, 
city. So perhaps you can include, because um, we talked a lot about public transportation as well, and um, we didn't get to hear back the situation in Senegal and Dakar about expanding public transportation to unserved areas, high poverty areas. So if you could also touch upon that, that would be great. Voilà, le, le cas du Sénégal, donc je, que je pourrais un petit peu well, euh, partager. In the context of the Senegal, there are a few things I would like to share with you. In the Dakar region, the state has set an objective of introducing cleaner transport and has launched many different projects. For example, we have uh, the project of an electrified train, which is being used, which was launched as a public means of transport, connecting the city center of Dakar with the airport. And in the first phase, this already covered 36 kilometers and even is to be expanded to reach another city. So that is one of our initial projects and this train will make it possible to transport around 80,000 passengers every day. It will be finalized over the course of 2024 and another city which is 50 kilometers away of Dakar will also be served by this train. So that is a Dakar related project and something else I wanted to talk about which is being implemented at the moment and to be launched at the end of the year is a rapid bus system which is 100% electrified with a battery that can be recharged with a di distance of 250 kilometers that can be covered with this battery. With this bus system we want to connect the north of Dakar with the city center and we also want to connect this to the new train system that we are developing at the moment. And thanks to this, the population can use these means of transport at an affordable price, which was stipulated by the government, by a government decree, to make it accessible for the entire project. This is a social tariff, you could say. That is a risk in itself, but the state is taking that risk to make it possible for the population to move freely. And these two projects are being implemented at the moment. And to give you a third example, we have an electric bus network that we are, will be working on over the next two years. It's not only connected to the bus rapid system, but also to the electric train. And by doing that, we make sure that we uh, make public transport accessible to even more people in the greater Dakar region. And it will also cut costs caused by congestion, for example. The electrified transport and these means of transport do not only make it possible for us to find a greener solution, but also to make it possible for our population to use public transport. Going back to the motorcycles, here we, they have a very special role. They are not as known as they are in Senegal as they are in Burkina Faso, for example. However, today we see a tendency to an increasing use of motorcycles because it is affordable for the younger generation. And we are now thinking about how or if we need to regulate that sector because there is no regulation as such at the moment. But we're working on making sure that all of these means of transport can be used and can coexist 
exist and uh, people can use public spaces to gather with these means of transport that are to complement each other to make public transport accessible for all groups of society. I would say that. Minister Filo, can you also share how you are connecting the peripheries? Eu queria fazer um comentário eh, anterior a essa que, sobre essa questão da, da transição para o transporte verde. É que como os desafios são muito diferentes. Well, the transition towards green transport, uh, we have seen that we have various challenges, and when it comes to the transition to green transport, I believe we are dealing here with a special problem. We need access for transport, we need low costs, and we need to make sure that somebody foots the bill, as has been said before. So, when we're dealing and talking about green transport these days, it's more costly than traditional and conventional transport. That's still the case, at least. There are many people who don't have access to transport, even if it is affordable. Now, if you now consider green transport becoming even more costly than conventional one, then you will understand that we are dealing with a huge challenge here. We need to guarantee more sustainability. No Brasil mesmo, a gente tem muita yeah. gente é, nos hospitais. And we need to make sure that motorcycles would be used less often. They are dangerous, a lot of accidents happen, and so on. But how come that so many people still use the motorcycle? Because they are easily accessible and they make people agile. And how often does it happen that an accident happens? Well, that, that's the big problem in front of us. We need to strike a balance then. We need to find a way where public resources are being put, uh, allow us to design a, a reliable and robust system and provide for affordable transport. That sounds easy, but it's difficult to be implemented. You need to define your uh, premises and your uh, options, but without resources, all that is very difficult. Now, in addition to that, the transition towards uh, electrification of individual transport cars and on so on, that is what happens particularly in the developed countries, for instance in Germany. Why is that the case? It's already a very complex question. It's predominantly the richer countries that develop the technologies, they export their vehicles into the whole world. In Brazil, we buy a lot of American cars, and the most important producers are China, uh, Germany, Italy, other European countries, and they produce a technology, export it, and the developing countries buy these vehicles from the richer countries. Because a lot of people live in developed countries, in, in, in uh, India, China, Pakistan, Indonesia. That's where the majority of people live, and also Africa. Of course, of course, that's why it's so important but that when we have a discussion around clean transport, we need to understand that each country has its own energy resources. We've got a very clean energy matrix, and environmental protection is very close to our hearts. We want to protect the environment, in contrast to the previous government in our country. But, of course, uh, this whole topic uh, is full of vulnerabilities. This energy transformation in the transport sector to implement this can lead to even more ex exclusion rather than inclusion. That's the dilemma in front of us. And has, it has been said that uh, when we try to, to find a solution and only after that we uh, find out what the problems are, then we would have uh, gotten off on the wrong foot. Green transport leads, probably in the first instance, to more problems. 
But if we want to have more affordable transport, then we probably are going to put more burden on the environment and even destroy it. That's a dilemma. Uh, we need to strike a balance here. But I think in this discussion it already transpires that it's important to understand what it's all about. And we already see that the countries understand what it's all about and that it's important to find a balance. Mayor, if I say I'm so happy that all you, these topics are so high back on Brazil's agenda, but of course these are complex issues, you know, not being able to properly calculate the costs that we don't uh, include, the long-term costs of not uh, transitioning quickly enough, but at the same time ensuring affordability for all is there. Uh, you wanted to react quickly, Eric? Yeah, because I think it's very important as we talk green transition that again, we make it more people-centric. At the end, you know, what we currently see, the discussion is very much technology-driven, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, which is, of course, important. You need innovation and the technology to get to a more climate-neutral economy. But if not all citizens will embrace it and start implementing it, or it will only be implemented by a happy few, you will not get to that climate neutral uh, society you are aiming for. So I think it's important in the context of discussions we have here today and also throughout the summit where we try to address solutions for mobility poverty, that we also think of what could be a methodology forward if we want to come up with policy in order to ensure that those social aspects around uh, mobility poverty are being addressed. I know in Europe they have the tendency each time there's new policy or legislation being introduced to do an impact assessment before a proposal gets through. That impact assessment is very often focusing on the, econ the impact on the economy, which is important. Huh? But perhaps we should complement it with a social Absolutely. impact assessment to ensure that whatever is being proposed has also taken into account the social dimension, the social aspects, you know, uh, in order to be inclusive in whatever solution we, we present or offer. So again, let's make it more people-centered, people-focused, because they will help us to make the difference. Thank you. Thank you for adding that point. I want to turn to the last sort of cross-cutting issue that we want to address in this round, because, of course, women can be amongst the most vulnerable of our um, low-income bracket communities. So talking about gender issues in this context is also important. I want to begin with a little quote of a very good friend of mine from Sao Paulo, um, which you reminded me of, actually, when you spoke earlier about safety issues. Um, uh, she once told me that she never felt so free as when she she lived for half a year in Berlin and was able to ride her bike through the city at night to get home without any fear of, of anything, basically. And this has really stuck with me. Um, so making transportation safe, safe for all, safe for women, is also a key issue in this conversation. Um, I'd love for you to share your thoughts on this and maybe also connect it to the public transportation issue that we talked about earlier, because, um, yeah, it tends to be that these systems are not necessarily designed for the most vulnerable. So, yes, could you please share your thoughts on this? Absolutely. And it really just follows from what he said, inclusive mm -hmm. transport. And I think there's now enough research which is showing that the way that women move around the city and the way that men move around the city are very different. And um, all transport, public transport, everything has been designed for an able-bodied male. And I think we need to recognize that most of the world is not made up of able-bodied men. I mean, even many men are not able-bodied. Age, we are an aging society. There are many people who lose mobility. And then women, women who are looking after children because the burden of the care work, unfortunately, globally still remains on children, uh, on women. So if we look at this, we see that their, tra their travel patterns are very different. The most obvious one is the fact that um, <clears throat> women tend to travel, do more trips in a day rather than one trip in the morning. So the way that men commute is they leave in the morning, they go to work, and they come back in the evening. So they do one long commute. Whereas what women tend to do is to 
you know, go and drop the child at school, maybe go to the market, maybe rush to her job for a while. And women tend to find work which is closer to their home because they have caregiving work. Um, maybe take an elderly parent to the, to the clinic, to the park, whatever. Uh, and so there is actually a research which is showing that because public transport is designed um, for commutes and not for shorter trips, there's less public transport when women need it, then women actually spend more, you know, because they spend, each, each little trip ends up costing more than the one commute up and down. And therefore, what do they do? Women walk more than using public transport. So I think, you know, um, uh, there is one statistic, a uh, study I think done by the World Bank, so that having a young child increases women's trips by 23% in their lives. So that's a lot of extra trips that they're making. And men are willing to accept a 14% longer commute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the second thing, which is very uh, the thing. And the third thing, the point of your friend from Sao Paulo is safety. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's uh, more than 50% and in some countries much higher um, have experienced sexual harassment while traveling in public transport or while waiting. And this is global. This is in the United States, in, 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 in Europe, in Africa, Asia. Of course, it's more in some countries, no doubt. Uh, and certain countries have better public transport. So I think you know, the different uh, way of uh, moving around, sexual harassment, and even the design of public transport. For example, in most public transport for women, an average woman holding that, um, uh, this thing on top is just a little bit higher than it's comfortable for us because it's designed for an average man. I mean, really, we have to stop designing the world for the average man because there is no average man. <laughs> I mean, the, the world is made up of women, it's made up of short men, tall men, disabled people, people with, you know, who, who are migrants and who don't know the language of that place. You know, I think we just need to be much more inclusive and very intentionally inclusive because it's not going to happen unless you are intentional about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I feel, feel everybody should be applauding right now. Eu também assino embaixo. I sign your words. <laughs> Um, may I ask you to also share on this topic, is this, are these issues that you're addressing in Kampala as well? And circling back to the very beginning, if you want to share a little bit more about how you were working for the interest of those 60% that you talked about in your first intervention. Okay. Uh, Kalpana is always uh, coming out about able-bodied men, and she makes me feel like I should be like a man. And, and also, when I'm riding my bicycle in my city, for example, uh, the women look at me as if I'm a man. I've been sharing this story. <laughs> what kind of woman is she to be on the streets that unsafe on the bicycle? So you feel you're losing your, your woman part of yourself because of the traffic and transportation situation. But what we are doing uh, so far is quite enviable, but we are slow. We could be faster. Uh, government, like you mentioned, uh, cannot do everything. The money is not adequate. The government is having uh, education, infrastructure, health, uh, security, you know, other issues major to deal with at the national level. and. Uh, uh, to, to zero down to the urban scenario of traffic and transportation and, and, and poverty is something that requires deliberate action by local governments. So we are empowering uh, the local governments to be inclusive and comprehensive in their planning, but we see there's a problem of the traditional style of mm. dreaming about a city that works, especially from the African context. If you visit Nairobi, you'll see that there's some destruction of public space. Come to Kampala, you see the flyovers uh, in the middle of the city, the city which has 60% of people walking, because we are dreaming about a city which looks glamorous, which has uh, uh, wide uh, expressways, highways, but not dreaming of a city that enables even the child and the elderly to walk freely, to go shopping, uh, to walk with the family together. So we still have that, and it's a behavioral issue. Even when the walkway is there, if people still think that it's 
a poor person's mode to walk, uh, I think that makes that investment uh, kind of uh, a loss. But the behavior aspect is also what we are working on. But we also did uh, what we call the pilot project for walking and cycling in the middle of the city. Uh, I think my friends and sisters from uh, Nairobi, my brothers from uh, uh, Africa who are here, I can see Emmanuel and Cyprian here. I think this is something admirable in Africa. We could all read about it in the middle of the city, chaotic as it can be. Uh, people were the majority, the cars were not moving, there was a lot of congestion, there was a lot of air pollution, and that's where business is in the city. So we de redesigned that street, but before we had to do awareness creation, uh, car free days, street days for people to see that actually walking has nothing to do with your poverty, with your wallet, with your age, with your, you can choose to walk. Uh, the fact is that we must make it a choice. Because, <laughs> so this street is a pilot in a way that it taught us how to work with the people, people-centric approach. Uh, it also taught us that you need information we need, you need expert on the ground information, the data that is actually practical, people feel it, but you also need to allow them to, to, to communicate. So when we meet them, we speak the local language. We don't go with our elitism. We listen to them and we allow them to explain their, their experiences. Uh, the other thing that we have uh, so far done is to have, of course, the policy. But for this particular example, of Namirembe Road, the design came before the policy, which is abnormal. So we can do things uh, in a different way, depending on the local context. And we are, we are dreaming of the bus rapid transit, but we don't want to make a mistake with it. We don't want vehicles where there is no infrastructure. We don't want vehicles where the public transport providers are not ready. We don't want buses where the investor will make losses and people will not choose to use them. Yes. Uh, we don't want to create uh, uh, walkways in low, dense areas where nobody is going to be walking. So we don't want to make mistakes and we are taking somehow long because of the fear of making mistakes. Mm -hmm. But to pilot has opened up our eyes that you can test the people, test, test them, see how they react. Thank and you. And then you get the feedback, then you go massive. Uh, into the planning process. I think Nairobi is uh, admiring our pilot and we encourage <laughs> the whole of Africa to stop destroying public spaces with those highways in the middle of the city. Well, I can't wait to be back in Kampala to see this for myself. Yes, let's have another round of applause for this because the last time I visited was around 10 years ago, so I, I can't wait to visit now. I feel like what you just shared also really helped pull the whole conversation together because as a first summary, as we're nearly reaching the end, I would say the problems may be very different, but the approaches for solutions involving all stakeholders are the same. So this is the last question I would like to ask you, Minister. How do you collaborate with local governments, private sector, to address the specific needs of, of impoverished communities? How are you doing this? in Senegal? Well, one of my duties, apart from being a minister, is that I am a mayor in Saloui. And at this race, they also race through this city and transport in Senegal is not a competence that can be transferred into every region. The central government is not responsible for it, but rather the local municipalities through the so-called um, council that is responsible for sustainable transport. They cooperate with these municipalities and public transport administrations and operators and we see a simplification of the, co of the coexistence of different means of transportation. We are looking for individual solutions for the different problems and challenges that different groups of the population are struggling with. And as a mayor, for example, I also go by bike. I do that in Saint Louis. 
However, I always see that that surprises people when they see me on the bike. Senegal is a tropical country. We have a lot of sand in the north of the country, and people are not, are not used to going by bike. And if you see the mayor going by bike, people are surprised and ask me why I do that. So we see that we need to increase accessibility and also expand and develop our infrastructure to make sure that different means of transport, local and regional, can be used. So that would be my answer to your question. Thank, thank you, you so much. Um, yes, I would like to thank all of you for this really insightful discussion. Let's have a big round of applause for the panel, please. That already brings us to the end of this plenary session. We now have a coffee break coming up. Sessions will resume in 30 minutes at 16.30. And after that, I hope to see you at the Saxonian cocktail reception, which is going to take place in the glass hall. And then that will be followed by the gala dinner. I hope you enjoy the rest of our program today. Thanks.